I just like to preface the slides that Peter is going to show by telling you um, something about um, a, a review that he had years ago. It must have been about 30 years ago, right? John Russell in the New York Times. Yeah, maybe a little more than 30 years ago. But significant and a really wonderful quote, um, Russell said in this very laudatory review, um, Human destiny is Mr. Solo's subject, where, whether it is treated as Ingmar Bergman treats it, in terms of private involvement, that is to say, or in terms of huge predicament that has not yet defined itself. Either way, and whether on a seashore or in an unnamed metropolis, Mr. Solo holds our attention. I think that's a really beautiful way of describing Peter's work. And I don't know, you know, everybody I think knows Peter from the extraordinary presence he is here in our village, for the kids here, for everybody, for art, for um, humanity. But tonight we really want you to take a look at his extraordinary work, it's so beautiful. So without further ado, let's start the slideshow and Peter will tell us about the work. Uh, first, I, uh, before I, we look at some slides, I would just like to uh, thank Eric and April for asking me to do this. Um, it's, uh, you know, oftentimes what happens in life is you conclude something, but you don't consummate it. And um, I've been, uh, you know, John Dewey, the, the great American philosopher and teacher, said that uh, any meaningful experience should be consummated, that it should have a beginning and a middle and an end. And I've been so busy doing things, uh, and there's a checklist of things that I had to do before my retirement, which is going to be uh, at the end of next week, that I hadn't really taken any time to consider uh, where I had been. Uh, I hadn't had time to. And so by um, Eric and April asking me to do this, first thing I had to do was like, pull together a whole bunch of slides, or I have slides of dating myself, digital images of... I still of, call them slides, yeah, okay. you know. <laughs> of, of my work, and I hadn't looked at much of this work for 25 years, you know, 20 years. Um, and um, I also had the opportunity a little to reflect on, um, you know, what I had learned from the experience of being around, uh, you know, uh, young people for the last uh, 21 years, not simply as a, um, as a teacher, but also, um, you know, as a coach and doing other things in the community. And so, you know, I want to thank you, you guys for doing that. Um, the work that, that's in this, uh, that I'm showing tonight uh, is not a comprehensive overview of my work. Um, for several different reasons. One is I had a tragic flood. Well, it wasn't tragic. It was mostly tragic flood in my studio last March. And it cost, uh, it cost a lot of money. And I destroyed my entire wardrobe of Duluth clothing, you know, my t-shirts and my socks and all that stuff. <laughs> Fortunately, none of the uh, paintings were destroyed. But a lot of the documentation of my work uh, went missing. Mm -hmm. And I had to reorganize a lot of that stuff. And uh, if you ask my, uh, my wife, Alicia, she'll tell you that I'm not the most organized person to start off with. So um, my work, the digital images of my work, um, is spread over five external hard drives like projectile vomit and <laughs> flash drives and all over the place. So many of the things that I'm showing tonight are things that were sort of readily available that I could find very quickly um, because you know, the other thing is, like, when, when I, uh, I titled stuff folders on my, my computer flash drive, I'll, I'll title them, like, a folder will be called Stuff, and then it will be called New Stuff, and, uh, or it will say, you know, from the red flash drive, and, you know, and, you know, so 
I really which, don't know. Which where, you knew you were never going to forget what that was when you wrote no, it. No, right. I mean, and I always tell myself, I will remember this because it's so important. And 10 minutes later, I can't remember what it was. And those stuff, I have, like on one of my, my computer that I, uh, um, um, I use now, I have four stuff folders. <laughs> and each of them has multiple folders inside of the folders. And it, it's a, you know, there's that Yiddish word, Mishigas. It's a Michigas. So, anyways, so without any further ado, why don't we just take well, a That might be a Michigas, but this is going to be a mitzvah, and I'm not qualified to use these terms, and I'm going to anyway. All right, we're going to start. So you're gonna, you're I'm going to do, do the clicker. April is going to do the clicker because I am totally incompetent with using both hands at the same time. Fascinatingly, Peter has a fear of clickers. Most men a, want the remote. The yeah, could we lower the lights, please? Um, but go ahead. So this is from 1986. Um, yeah. The titles and the dimensions are below um, these images and from 1986. So this is 56 by 72 inches. So this is a very sizable painting. Yeah, and, and this is uh, oil on, on canvas. Uh, this particular painting is at the Smithsonian Institute in the Museum of American Art. Uh, we can go to the next one. Okay. Okay, this is, a, this is actually a really huge painting. It's uh, 96 by 144, and it's called Solace. And Solace is a song uh, written by Scott Joplin. It's not, a, it's not a rag, it's more of a tango. And it's, I think, one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard. And this is a, a, a painting that was the maximum size of painting that I could do uh, when I had my studio on Lafayette Street. Um, this was the size of my wall. I had a 12-foot wall, so this would just fit in there. Um, and uh, we can go to the next one if you want to. I mean, that's a huge painting. Yeah, and, and this uh, city square, this is actually, April doesn't remember this, but uh, we were in a, an exhibition together at the Aldridge Museum, and this is the painting that was in that show. Oh, my God. Yeah, that, you know, Doug Maxwell put together. Yes. Yeah. And um, this is actually... Uh, a painting that, one of the only paintings that I'm showing here that I still have, this one is in our living room, which is nice because I get to look at it, you know, all the time. Um, well, I just want to say that the memory of this and our being in the show together is in a folder called Stuff in My Brain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, was that for an excuse? <laughs> anyway. Okay, next one. Okay. You know, again, high tide. These are pretty large paintings, 72 by 96. And all these paintings were done uh, uh, in New York City. Um, there was a really very, very kind article written about me in the Sag Harbor Express, and they did get some things a little, a little wrong. Um, I was born in New York City, but I grew up in upstate New York in a little village called Manlius, which is about 10 miles outside of Syracuse. And uh, then went to Boston for a year to school, and then, uh, around 1971, 72, uh, moved back to New York City. And from that time, and went to school there. And from that time until 90, I lived in New York City. In 1990, we, we moved out here. So this is from New York City also. Okay. Uh, this was uh, one of the paintings that I started when we moved out here. Um, I had, uh, I didn't know where Sag Harbor was, uh, except for that little sign that they have in, water, uh, in, in Bridgehampton that says Sag Harbor, like seven miles or five miles. And we used to, I mean, from the time I was younger, I used to go out to Montauk. And during the summer when I was living in New York City, uh, we would go out to Montauk uh, past, uh, you know, a ditch plains past the East, east Deck. Uh, and where the trailers were, there were uh, the association houses uh, built by McKinmead and White, and one of them was run as a bed and breakfast without breakfast. Uh, and it was the cheapest place in Montauk to stay, and for years we would go out there, and uh, Elise had a legit job, and I was like a shiftless artist, so I could go out for extended periods of time. And uh, I would go to Gin Beach and, and do drawing there and uh, pretend to get, you know, swim, which I occasionally do. But uh, this is one of the paintings from, uh, from Jim Beach. 
And, um, but this is European, if it's called Piazza One, I think, most likely. Yeah, I mean, it, what happened is that um, when I was younger, I really didn't get an opportunity to travel too much. And then uh, Elise and I went on a belated honeymoon, and we went to Italy, and uh, I was absolutely blown away by what I saw there, um, both in, in the museums and Italian, uh, Italian painting, which I wasn't all that familiar with, but also uh, it was very reminiscent of the experience I had in New York City. And there's that the incredible Giacometti uh, sculpture called City Square uh, that, that's like not that big, but it's this idea of uh, people who are, find themselves in the same space, uh, but they don't know each other by accident, by coincidence, they're there together. And when I saw the piazzas and later the, the, the campos in, in Venice, I thought that this was the coolest thing ever. Uh, and just this idea of people walking through the space um, was just really something exciting to me. So I started doing a whole series of paintings uh, that have to do with that city square, the piazza thing. And I've been doing that you know, for the last 25, 30 years. And uh, playing around with just Italian landscape, uh, which again, I, I found extraordinary. Um, and uh, at first, I mean, I, I, some of the worst drawings I've ever done in my life was the first time I tried to draw some of the landscapes and I was so taken with it. Uh, there was one incident I had where, it's incident, it wasn't an incident. I was, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, Florence, but there's a church on the, on the south side of the, uh, on the Old Toronto, on the south side of the, of the Arno, called San Miniato del Monte, and it's this beautiful church. And there's a, one of the original Renaissance walls is still there. And of course, typical of, of uh, Italy at that time, we went to go to Belvedere, which is this, this fortress on the south side, to get these panoramic views and have lunch. And of course, it was closed for restoration. <laughs> so we ate lunch by a dumpster that was like underneath the wall. <laughs> and then afterwards, you know, this was back in the day where you had postcards. I was with a bunch of people. So we, we were walking on the outside of the wall. Across the valley was uh, San Miniato, which was beautiful. And we sat underneath olive trees, and the other people were, were uh, you know, filling out postcards, and I was trying to do drawing, and in the background, I swear to God, this happened. This, I'm not making this up. There was somebody playing Italian opera in in these farmhouses that are there. One of the things that's really cool about the south side of Florence is, 800 yards outside of the city, you're in sort of this country and these beautiful like farmhouses and stuff there. So I was trying to draw this, and. I was so overwhelmed by how beautiful and wonderful and the Italian music and stuff, the drawings I did were absolutely unmitigatedly horrible. <laughs> and to the, you know, and, and it stuck with me how horrible they were. And later on, if we get to talk a little about process, uh, you know, and drawing, what I realized was that um, I had abandoned everything I knew about how to approach doing drawing because I was so captivated by what I was looking at. And um, there was a lesson in that, um, you know, in spite of my embarrassment, I still have a couple of those drawings in a sketchbook and occasionally I, by accident, run into them and get depressed and start drinking. <laughs> but the drawing, there's drawing in this painting. Right. It's, I mean, there's, there's a beautiful amount of drawn lines that, that accumulate and accumulate and accumulate and you have air kind of running through them, and then you have this beautiful congestion of fields and, and houses, and, and then that beautiful, wide, like, infinity of the sky above. And there's clearly, in all of your work, there's a, there's a kind of an accumulated mark-making process that I think is really, really striking. You feel yeah. the hand in your work very powerfully, and it also has a lot of air in it. So it's not, it doesn't have a kind of belabored quality. It has a, a searching quality. I, I look at the, I look at your work and I think he's a seeker. You know, like you're, you're questing after the spirit of a place or the genius of a place as people used to say. Yeah, uh, well, I, I think that that's sort of uh, on target. 
that there's always in my work a reciprocal thing between drawing and, and you know, uh, painting sort of flatter surfaces, but that drawing is essential to the process. And because of the, uh, the people who were my teachers when I went to school, when I went to college, all of whom, well not all of whom, many of whom were abstract, second generation abstract expressionists. Um, and people who had studied with abstract expressionists, everybody from Wolf Kahn and Paul Resica, who aren't abstract expressionists, but they had studied with Hoffman. And then there was uh, a whole bunch of these guys, and it was all about process, and it wasn't about knowing. It wasn't about knowing and just putting down stuff that you knew, but it was about trying to, it was a, a, about discovering something. Mm -hmm. and, and the method of discovering uh, for me was to draw. And, and not to draw literally what I saw, but to, to, um, to try to discover a language that would be um, the equivalent of what I was looking at. So. Yeah, that's the Arno. You can see it. It's, and it's, there's a little Turner going on here, I would say, as well. Is, it, is that someone that you... Yeah, I like mean, admire. you know, um, if you go, if you live, well, Turner, yeah, and, and definitely people like uh, Monet. Um, if you go, if you live in New York City, if you go to museums there, you become very familiar with uh, Impressionism. Uh, and I spent hours and hours looking at Impressionist paintings. Um, I, you also become very familiar with, like, Dutch painting. Um, and, but... Yeah, I mean, this became, this was, you, you can talk about Turner, you can talk about the Impressionists, and, and uh, you know, sometimes, one of the things I can't stand uh, about art historians is that when they write about artists, they think they know what goes on in the particular painting or with a particular artist. And I have to tell you, honestly, I don't know what goes on hmm. uh, a lot of times when I'm painting. And, but sometimes um, the... What, what will inspire you is, or what, where, you, where you're heading with something, will be maybe a little different from a divergent from what you've been doing before. Um, this was actually uh, done from some drawings I did from San Miniato late in the afternoon. Uh, you get these incredible sunsets uh, to the west. That's like looking west. And uh, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it's absolutely, you know, wonderful. And so one of the things I was trying to do was to capture that feeling of the light uh, um, in that, at that particular time from that particular place. There's also a quality of, there's this, I want to say, I wrote down some words when I was looking at your slides before. There's a haunting quality they're personal and impersonal at the same time. They're really fascinating that way. It's almost like I don't feel like you're making um, figures that you're disinterested in. I think you're passionately interested in them. But you've somehow obscured their identities or protected their privacy. Um, can you talk about that at all? Or is that being too oblique? Um, well... I think that I, I think that what happens is um, that I mean this this picture is interesting in that there were um, things that I was looking at, not copying, but that I was looking at. That there's a Hugo van der Goes picture in the um, Uffizi, and there is one figure that's kneeling, a woman figure that's kneeling, and uh, I also love Mary Cassatt. And she has all of these pictures, beautiful pictures, of uh, mothers and their children. And I was sort of thinking a little about that. And the other, the other figure is, uh, I mean, all of the figures here are basically invented. Uh, and I, I, I think that, that, that there's something to what you said. And I think that the reason that you end up this way is, uh, I mean, I don't know. Uh, what your process is in terms of when you know when something is finished. Um, I used to have, a, I used to joke about it, I used to have a rocking chair and I said, well, I know that a, a painting is finished when 
I don't feel compelled to get out of the rocking chair and do something to it. <laughs> um, and so there's a kind of um, intuitive sensibility about when things are done. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also, in terms of if you look at the, the faces or what you're talking about, there's this incredible painting in the Museum of Fine Arts uh, in Boston, The Execution of Maximilian by Manet. And it's not the finished versions of The Execution of Maximilian. It's a very big painting. But it's this sort of sketch, even though it's huge painting. And the color in it and the vibrancy in it and the way that he depicts the features on people's faces. When I was a very young, at one time I was young, when I was a very young person going to school there, I saw this painting and I thought it was absolutely the most remarkable thing I had ever seen. And I, I said to myself, I want to paint like that. I don't want to copy the style exactly, but I want the feeling that I get when I'm looking at this, I want my paintings to be like that. And that, um, that painting has inspired my, me my entire life. Mm -hmm. And I have a catalog, this thin little uh, crapped up catalog that has that picture in it in my studio. And it's one of the uh, only things that I've, I think I've kept the entire time. And the way the faces are painted in it are very similar to this in the sense that there aren't really um, very distinct features, yeah. but it's more a sense of, of, and you know, for me, you know, painting is about language mm -hmm. and, and trying to find a, a particular language. You know, at one point, like earlier on, like in, I think it was in the 70s, uh, one of my teachers, a really remarkable woman named Dory Ashton, uh, put on a, a, a show called Painting Indoors because at that time there was a big thing about whether painting had any future. And there also was uh, these big battles going on in the school I went to um, between the abstract minimalist painters and the figurative painters and stuff like that. And so one of the things I always thought about was how to paint, how to paint uh, people, how to paint the figure in a way that was Mo that was contemporary, that, that had meaning uh, in a contemporary way. And, and that's something that I've been thinking about my entire, my entire career. Yeah. So that's Long Beach. Oh, she wasn't on Long Beach. I just sort of threw her in there, but, <laughs> but that's Long Beach. Okay, this is a series that you, you would ask me to put these in there. I had done a series, these are, these are uh, pencil and acrylic on paper, of uh, New York City uh, scenes. And this is actually outside of the Flatiron Building. Um, and um, again, you, know, you get inspired by different things and, and you know, so I'm sort of like all over the place. So you know, you, you know those child has some pictures of Fifth Avenue. Uh, with the flags and stuff, and I thought, wow, those are really those are really cool and this kind of impressionist thing. So if you go through, you can see in, in the other ones. So I did a whole bunch of these. Uh, there's about 20 of them in, in total, um, just trying to capture the kind of vibrance and the energy of, of people in the city. Um, it's funny because uh, some of my students will, uh, when we were trying to draw the figure, they mentioned to me that people move. And I say, yes, they do move. <laughs> and you have to draw really fast. And you have to try to, you have to, you have to, try to capture them. And so this, is, this was part of this, uh, you know, the series. Well, you anchor, you anchor, you always anchor with something, the edge of water or the hard line of the edge of a building or, but then there's a sense of, of mark making and people and movement and light passing through everything almost interchangeably, which I think is a very um, powerful thing to express. It's because it's about the passage of time and you know how, how fragile everything is. There's like, there's like a, a durable core of your work, but then there's also this, this kind of sense of time uh, moving through it. Sometimes uh, I am troubled by the fact that everything, not everything, but many things in the painting seem to be so fluid, so sort of transient. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, so occasionally I'll try to do a painting where everything is like uh, Grant Wood's American Gothic. <laughs> I'd like to and, see that you know, one. Oh, I shouldn't mention pitchforks because I it just, <laughs> I ran into a pitchfork today. Peter literally ran into a pitchfork today on Main Street. Who can say that? So <laughs> I've had a series, you know, you, you talk about the, the great, uh, the, the paradox of, well, not paradox, but, you know, we, we know from our experience of the last two years that unexpected things happen all the time. And um, in the context of the major unexpected things that have happened, when minor unexpected things happen, you should um, not get upset about them. You should sort of uh, see the comic relief in them. So, uh, I'll, can I tell the, the, the rib thing? Okay, of course. I will. So about a month ago, I was getting ready to school at five, school five o'clock in the morning in my studio, and I, I coughed so hard that I fractured a rib. And being, the, being sort of like not the smartest person in the world, I said, okay, I'll go to school and I'll, I'll, like, you know, I'll be all right. And then I realized I couldn't move. And then I thought, okay, I'll go to the hospital, I'll drive myself to the hospital and that will be fine. And then I realized I couldn't drive if I was holding my side with both hands so Elise drove me to the hospital. So that was like a, about a month ago. And for like a week or so, I, I could, literally couldn't do anything. The only reason I'm bringing that up is I was thinking, you know, in, you know that there's comic relief in that because, you know, who, who like coughs and breaks a rib? So today, I went to Goldberg's to get my morning bagel. And as I'm walking out, I run into a pitchfork that is on a village of Sag Harbor truck. And I'm thinking to myself, all right, how many pitchforks are there in Sag Harbor? How many pitchforks are there in Main Street in Sag Harbor? So, um, you know, so I went to school and I was sort of bloodied up, but it was good because I was only proctoring and the kids looked at me and said, whoa, you know, what happened? And it took their mind off of the standardized tests that they had to take, so it was okay. Well, don't forget that 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 trucks at Village of Sag Harbor, so someone might be responsible for leaving a pitchfork sticking out. Yeah, but you know, on the other hand, um, what is the probability that one would run into the one pitchfork that was stuck out of a, you know? That's just you, your specialness. No, for I sure. think, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> This definitely has that Hassam quality. And again, this is 60 by 80 inches, so this is a pretty large painting, and an oil painting. It's interesting when something in the foreground, like these figures, start to dissolve into the background. I mean, typically that's, that's where your anchor would be, and yet they're almost starting to dissolve. There's also a sort of an echo of their movements as they're standing still. They do a lot of figures that are relatively stationary, but there's still a kind of sense of them coming apart internally. This is another uh, uh, painting from Gin Beach in Montauk and uh, the breakwater there. Okay, let me explain this. Um, I, I've had an opportunity of working with a number of the um, organizations in town and you know, both with student work and, and sometimes with my own work. And uh, I, I put on a show at the Whaling Museum that was called City Square and there were actually four panels. And the goal of the, well, it, it, the space was imperfect with this because you have like that very attractive thing on the right hand side and tables and all the windows. But the idea originally was this idea of having people walk in and be surrounded by very large scale paintings uh, of, uh, or, or artwork that uh, would immerse you in the experience of being in a city square. So you would be in the middle of it. And the other thing that I wanted to do is I wanted the show to actually be an explanation of the process I used to do paintings. So that it would be made up of painting, but it would also be made up of drawings that came from my sketchbook and photographs. 
And one of the things that we were able to do, and we've been playing around uh, with digital technology, is taking a small drawing that's like this size and blowing it up so it's like seven feet tall. And so that, that whole area on the left-hand side is actually from my sketchbook. And so if you, if you go to the next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll so, um, you know, uh, after that, I had a, um, at the temporary uh, li library that was on across from the post office, um, Kathy, Kathy Creeden, who, one of the most remarkable people I've ever met, and uh, just an extraordinary, uh, incredible uh, contribution to our community. Uh, when she was over there, when the library was over in its temporary space, there was all kinds of program going on there, all kinds of great stuff, and uh, it's a real tribute to her. And it's a tribute to her that uh, the renovation on uh, John Germain got done. Uh, she gave me, uh, or they gave me an, an exhibition, and most of the exhibition were small works, or when I say small, 42 by 36 inch uh, mixed media. Uh, paintings. And what I did is I undid one of the panels that, was, that you saw in the other slide and I started painting back into it because my intention was never that that thing that you saw in the last slide was finished. That was just sort of the beginning. And my idea always was to, you know, if you're going to blow something up big like that, is to work back into it, paint back into it, uh, have that personal handmade thing so that it's not just digital that it's not something that's just done, you know, coming through a printer, but that there's a human, you know, there's humanity to it, that there's a touch to it. And this is something that I've been playing around with on and off for the last number of years and uh, working, you know, being inspired by uh, initially uh, my daughter who did some uh, things that looked totally different but that were, were like this, but then working with, uh, Scott Sandel um, and doing a whole bunch of variety of uh, things with kids related to using digital technology and the printers, the large format printers, and, and thinking about how I could, I could use some of that, that, those ideas in my own work. So this was starting, you know, so what I would do is this was going to be like, a, you know, uh, while the rest of the show was going on, and there were people in the library, I would be in there painting like in front of everybody and it would be sort of this cool thing. And if you look at the, down at the bottom there's a little mouse. And that's because a, a little kid had come in and she was looking at the thing and I just like looked at, we got into a conversation. I told her I would, I would paint a mouse on the wall. And this was right before I think that you were moving out of the space so that we could paint on the wall without getting in trouble. <laughs> so anyways, so that's what this is. It is so sweet. I didn't see that little mouse when I was looking at the slides. And this before. is sort of a, this is a, a later version of the same thing. I'm still working on this. This was, I think, in 2015, 16. I, I can't remember. It was a while ago. And I'm still working on these things in, in parts. But if you can see the figure that's starting to emerge, the, the, the guy that's starting to emerge from this, um, that's just from these very loose lines. And then by looking into it, trying to find or discover figures or people. And this is, uh, um, again, this is uh, 32 by 42. And this is just a straight out, uh, you know, drawing, graphite drawing with, with uh, uh, pencil and uh, some paint. And this is uh, one of the things that I've been, again, experimenting with where I had a very small, very sort of loosely drawn thing from my sketchbook. If you look at the right hand side, Pretty much the whole thing was like that. And then to try to discover and draw back into it and make it into a personal, uh, uh, you know, a handmade thing again, you know, blowing it up uh, with a digital technology and then working back into it, painting back into it, drawing back into it so that it really becomes something which has a metamorphosis in it. And once again, up at San Miniato, it's one of my favorite places. And this is, uh, you know, a drawing from there. Okay, and, and this is sort of like, um, I have a whole bunch of these that, um, that are a combination of 
uh, really going sort of crazy with the digital technology, the multiple you know, images of the same person, uh, a painting, uh, inventing other, other figures and painting back into it. Um, I sort of like the idea of putting clouds in the middle of the piazza, you know, just to make it a little more confusing. And, uh, you know, um, and so this is something, again, that, I, that I've been playing around with. So this is, um, this is a, a digital print drawn back into, painted back into um, on canvas. <coughs> and this is a piece that I'm still working on. That's my daughter who is on her cell phone in the Spanish chapel <laughs> thinking about where Mario's is so we can get like steak. <laughs> and so that's what she's doing. And the other people there are, um, you know, this is from, uh, you know, other drawings and paintings that I've done. And again, I'm working back into this. This is uh, 44 by 30, uh, 37 inches. I like that she witnesses those people. There's, there's like a kind of a cross witnessing going on. Okay, and the last two slides, uh, if I can explain. Uh, a number of times, uh, this is a study for high tide. High tide is, uh, I've done a number of things I've called high tide just to confuse myself and everybody else in terms of, of, of the work. But I, I was working on in the, I think around two, 2000, I'm thinking five or six, I was working on a painting that was 60 by 80 inches, oil painting, uh, called High Tide. And I, I worked on it and I put it away and I didn't look at it and when I pulled it out, Every once in a while when I would have somebody over and uh, show my work, I would pull it out and I would look at it and there was something about it that really bothered me. I mean, really bothered me. And I couldn't quite figure it out. It was the, 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 the feeling of the paint, whatever. And so um, what I was doing in preparation for actually retirement was I took a, uh, I made a digital print of it and then started working back on the digital print and massively transformed the painting from what it was. And that's why it's a study because the next step is gonna to be to take the big one out and with oil to, to paint back into it. Using this as a catalyst for this, for the, the bigger painting, but not trying to copy this exactly, but getting me going on, on the painting. So it's a kind of, again, a reciprocal thing between the smaller things and the larger yeah, things. Yeah, that's exciting. That's a great dialogue when you have that kind of scale shift thing that suddenly makes you look at potential differently. I mean, I know their case, too. So this is a very bizarre story. Uh, well, I'm going to make it very quick because this is the last slide and I, you know, uh, other things. Uh, I was commissioned, like, uh, you know, in the war in Bosnia, which was, I think, it, it ended around 84 uh, or 90, what was it, 94 or 95, uh, and the horrific things that were happening in Bosnia. I had, got, had gotten a commission from Norman Herschel uh, to do a big painting, um, a painting that was uh, six by eight feet. And I worked on the painting, and the painting was shown and the painting wasn't with me for a while, and it's a whole convoluted story, but the painting ended up back in my studio. And, and I'm talking about like around maybe 2005 or six. And when I saw the painting, I was really upset about how awkwardly figures in the painting were painted. And I really was, you know, not happy with it at all. And so I said to myself, when I get a chance, when I retire, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to fix that painting. Now, if you, we're talking about, the, what, 2022? Yeah. Okay. That's so the now. painting is like more than, you know, it's 25, 30, uh, you know, it's, it's old. Um, and the painting now, the bigger painting is now on my wall. And it's going to be the first thing that, it's going to be the first thing that I start painting on uh, in a week and a half. Um, Yay, that's exciting. Yeah. That's great. But to get ready for that, I tried to, uh, to challenge myself to fix some of the things that troubled me about the painting on a smaller scale. And part of the reason for that, I mean, look, this is what I, what, when I said before that sometimes like art historians and, and art critics don't know what they're talking about like almost all the time. 
the reason that I was working on a lot of small things was because of plants. Because I made the terrible mistake of starting to grow tropical plants that have to come in during the winter. And so my entire studio shrinks to like a third of what it is during the summer. I'm, I'm a seasonal painter. So, um, so uh, and I'm talking, I'm talking about like lemon trees, and I'm talking about like uh, all kinds of other stuff that's crazy. You know, bird of paradise, all the stuff that, that grows like in the tropics without any problem, I grow it in my studio. So I was working on this, and um, then what gave me some urgency about it was uh, the Ukraine. And uh, I immediately, you know, said to myself that uh, if you, I don't know how many of you remember, but what was going on in, in, in Bosnia, what was going on in Sarajevo was horrendous, was horrible and was comparable to what we now see going on in the Ukraine. And I thought that there was a kind of urgency to try to finish this. So that's the first thing I'm gonna do when I, uh, uh, when I get back to my studio. That's some sort of perfect example of the way that artists think, that something you did 25 years ago could just be still there that long afterwards, oh, it's that it obsessive. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, you guys probably, there's some things I do that really piss me off. I mean, I, I mean, when I look at them and I, and I, it bothers me that I'll leave something in a certain way. And so, so that's it. Um, I am going to stop the slideshow. Can we turn the lights back up a little bit, please? And um, I wanted to ask you, um, with the audience, is there any questions that, people would like to ask about the slides in particular before I ask Peter some questions about his involvement with Pearson and the school and the art students. Yes, please. Nice to see you. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I'm wondering, I am curious about the process. Like you said, for example, the early one at the beach, you did it in New York City. So could you explain, like, did you go to the beach and sketch or did you work, what did you, how did, well, it, it, well, thanks for the question. It's, it's sort of strange because when I was living in New York City, I did some paintings of New York City, but I did a lot of paintings of the east end of Long Island. When I moved to the east end of Long Island, I started painting Italy and New York City. <laughs> and uh, I would say that, that all, of, all, all of the work I, I do is associated with references that are you know, real, real life and drawing, drawings or photographs that I've, that I've taken, you know, in the real places and I, I they, they may be transformed into something different or something that might be with like the piazza, something that's more universal. The, um, the structure of that one piazza scene that was in there with the three figures is actually the Piazza Signoria from, uh, from Florence, but in a very sort of abstracted way. So, um, yeah, I actually do a lot of, I, I draw all the time, and I do a lot of research. Uh, well, when I say research, I, I uh, you know, I try to go to places and then use that stuff as a, as a reference or a resource. Yeah. Here comes the mic. Yes. Um, what really strikes me in these paintings are is your sense of perspective. It's just overwhelming. I don't know how you began studying it or was it a natural, you know, born thing with you or, but I, I keep thinking of Veronese's drawings and uh, did you know those and did you see those and were they, did they inspire you? Um, but you really know how to draw. There's no doubt about it. But I love the sense that you give us the underlying or underpinning um, structure uh, of each of each picture, of each drawing. Uh, well, thanks. I mean, I, I think that if you um, you if you spend time, uh, I mean, even in the in the um, you know even in the landscapes, uh, you know, I it used to be that I could say to my students you know, space, the final frontier, and they would know what I was talking about, but they don't know. Uh, but the idea of space and the manipulation of space, and again, a lot of it may be just, in, uh, um, 
you know, a sensibility or intuitive feeling about what, what feels right. Um, I think when I was, I was much younger, many of my paintings were very flat. They had a sort of very shallow space, in part because I was, uh, I was painting in a much more sort of abstract expressionist way with very heavy paint. From, your, from the influence of your teachers, presumably, yeah, uh, in part. Yeah, I mean, I, I was very fortunate in that I, when, I went to, uh, when I went to Cooper Union was sort of a magical time there for two reasons. One was that they had just closed, you know, Cooper Union, uh, the mandate of it is extraordinary. It was that uh, Peter Cooper felt everybody should have an education. It didn't matter how much money you had, anything like that. So for many years, it's not that way now, but for many years, Cooper Union was absolutely free. And they had a night school. And the night school had people in it who had families, were working, they were older. Well, they closed the night school and they folded those people into the, the, the day school. And so when I arrived there, there were kids in my class, they weren't kids, there were people in my class that had fought in Vietnam and were back, uh, who had families, who had, had a professional life. So instead of going to, a, to a, a school where everybody was my age, there were people who were in the, that, that were classmates that were older. And it really was a pretty extraordinary thing there. And then there was the faculty. And the faculty ranged from people like, and I don't, I'm going to say some names that you probably don't know, John Walker. Um, you had uh, uh, Chris Wilmarth, who was an extraordinary sculptor. Ruben Kadish, who was a childhood friend of Jackson Pollock's and was a wonderful, wonderful sculptor. They, and at the Pollock Krasner House, they had one of his uh, you know, sculpture show. He was a, and I had this great relationship with these guys. Uh, Kadish uh, came up to the sixth floor where the painting studios were, and he wanted to see the sculpture I was doing for his class because I never showed up for his class. And he saw these little dinky wax sculpture things, and I was doing these monumental paintings. And he looked at them and he said, oh my God, this is terrible. And he said, I will pass you in the class if you promise never to sculpt again. Okay? Then there was Todd Popper George. I don't know if you're familiar with him, the photographer. And Popper George looked at my photographs and said, this isn't photography. This is terrible. And so I said, okay, maybe I don't have a future as a photographer. Um, but later on, I understood what he was talking about. And what he was talking about really became, uh, for the students that I teach, became sort of the foundation the concept, the conceptual foundation of what I think is important in photography. So you had, as I mentioned before, you had a, a, a wonderful guy, Nick Marsicano, who was a good friend of Franz Klein's. I, Philip, uh, Philip Gustin. Um, you know, as I said, Dory Ashton, whose class I sort of, and it was so flaky. I mean, there was so, it was so loose there. I took Dory Ashton's class for four years in a row, and I wasn't supposed to. And Dory Ashton's class opened, you know, remember, I was like this kid from the country, uh, you know, from like a rural background, really. And she opened my eyes up to art. She read, wrote this beautiful book, A Reading of Modern Art. Uh, of, of modern art. She edited a book of uh, Picasso's commentary on, on art. She introduced me to the book Matisse on Art, which is a book that I still have and that I read occasionally. Um, and, uh, you know, she talked about the cult, she talked about how how artists had to have an inventory. She called it the culture of, of art. And what she was really talking about was an inventory that you could retrieve of images that you had seen that could influence you and that, that, that you could, you, a reservoir that you could rely on all the time. And uh, she was just like wonderful. And, and it was hilarious too because all these Columbia graduate students would come down to see her class. And so she would be talking French to them and we were talking before, I failed French three years in a row in high school, so I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. Or she would get somebody like Hunter Wasser, you know, uh, to come and talk to us, and he was speaking German, and she could speak German. None of us know, knew what he was talking about. Or Emilio Vedova, which was this really crazy Italian sculptor from Venice, and he was speaking Italian, and nobody could speak Italian. And, they, and she, Vedova's wife would translate and stuff. But we had all these, we, we met, Noguchi came and visited us. Wow. And, and so, there, so there was this incredible, and we had Hans Hacke, who was a you know, conceptual artist, um, who would be having these kind of uh, intellectual arguments with 
other people who were doing figurative work and more, you know, and so this is what it, what it was like, and it was great. It was just a wonderful experience. Did, it, did, that, did that particular part of your art learning carry on into the way that you teach students? Do you try to give them an inventory of art that they can reference? Uh, yeah, I think the most important thing that is, you know, is about the idea of process. And not that there's one particular artistic process, but that there's a multiplicity of processes. And you know, whenever you try to define something, you know, I, I uh, for comic relief for my students, I've uh, been asked to teach a lot of academic subjects besides art subjects. And one like, like the theory of knowledge. Yeah, okay. Peter teaches the theory of knowledge. Okay, I'm not so, kidding. He's going to do that here. Yeah, I too. think that. Yeah, okay. Uh, Mike Guinan, who's our assistant pr uh, principal, is here. Is a, you know, terrific, wonderful, you know, knowledgeable guy. And I'm, I guarantee the reason I'm teaching theory of knowledge is they understood I didn't know anything, and because I didn't know anything, the kids could find in me a kindred spirit because they didn't know anything either. So we could not know everything together. And it would be this like wonderful experience. Um, but uh, what I was going to say is, that, you know, if you can't define something, you can talk about the characteristics of it. So in terms of of process, talking about art, you can talk about what what are the elements of it that that indicate, you know, what what effective process is, and it also ultimately ends up in good work, you know, and so. I talk to the kids a lot about process, and the reason that I, and, and this is something that I drew from Cooper Union, because, um, because so much of what went on there was about different approaches to painting, and, and, and about not knowing, about, uh, there's that great quote that I, I can't, I'm paraphrasing it, so I, I'm not gonna even say it, by Franz Klein, it's not about knowing. You know, um, it's, a, it's about giving, and it's about, it's about about exploring stuff and, 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 you know, at the same time, you know, one of the things that we have as a goal, and this, you know, always, is to give the kids voice and to have them, give them the facility and the fluency to be able to, to, you know, to have a voice. I mean, there's nothing quite as bad as, you know, not having a voice, not being able to articulate, you know, what you, but I, and not to mention that process, I think, and having a, having an opportunity to experience process coming from your own sensibility and your own psychology and makeup is what will advance you toward knowing yourself enough to make art out of yourself by yourself, rather than rather than learning a technique or something like that. It's it's so much more interesting, and that's how advancements are made. Yeah, I, the be, the Personal most, advancements. The, the most it. important experience I had in terms of learning how to draw, uh, Nick Marsicano, again, I mentioned him before. Nick Marsicano was the son of a coal miner. And he, again, was this, uh, he was married to Merle Mar Marsicano, who was a modern, uh, modern choreographer, dancer. And Nick was one of these guys that would come to class with a sports jacket on and a tie and there was a kind of dignity to him. And if there was a crit, he would like sit there, he would look at your work, and he wouldn't say anything for like 10 minutes. And he smoked cigarettes that, in, it was amazing, we would always watch him. The cigarettes would have the longest like, you know, ash on them, with that, and we would wonder when is the ash gonna fall? Um, you know, this is one of the things I remember about him, but Nick would say, I spent four years having Nick say things to me that I didn't understand what he was talking about. I mean, that he would say something like, uh, a man like uh, a man like Tinaretto would make black look like white, and I would go, "Holy shit!" <laughs> you know. Uh, but he was wonderful, and he he was a wonderful teacher, and he 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 had a dignity about him, and 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 a love a love of art and a love of making. And listen, he couldn't stand sculptors. He couldn't stand anybody, but painters were the, the highest level of in his like pantheon of things. But there was a kind of dignity to him, and and that was an inspiration. The reason I mention Nick is that Nick got a good loft, like a big loft on 15th Street, and he l used to have a dinky little studio on Little West 12th Street. Sounds very quaint. Now, if you go to the High Line now and you look at Little West 12th Street, 
it is so she I mean it's so like upscale all this kind of stuff okay little West 12th Street when I lived there he gave me he, he turned over the lease to me for a hundred and forty dollars a month and uh, it was a cold water flat the stairs were falling down it was on the third floor and it was in the middle of the meatpacking district and it was really really rough at the end, we're at the end of the west side of it were the S and M bars. At the other side, there was a bar, and somebody had gotten shot there. You know, you go through this. I, I used to walk from Cooper Union, which is you know over on St. Mark's Place, up um, you know up Greenwich Avenue. You know, this wonderful. And I go through the West Village, and it was so cute. And then you get to this area where Gaines Fort Street is, Little West 12th Street, and there's this empty like square. And it was like you went to another world. Yeah, dark and, and it creepy. Was, and like it, it, in the middle of the night, you'd look out the window, and there would be uh, garbage trucks full of carcasses going by. And go, whoa, this is like a thing. But the thing that was so cool about it at this time, and this is why I swear to God, I wish that we could get rid of cell phones. I wish we could get rid of any kind of phones, any kind of communication. Because what happened when I lived there is I didn't have a phone. I didn't have a television set. I didn't have anything to listen to music. But what I had were little pieces of paper about this big, hundreds of them. And all I did was draw. I'd go home and I'd, and from school, and Rasputin, my cat, greatest cat of all times, would greet me. And I would sit in this place, and I would draw the table. I would draw the, the little cot that I slept on. I would draw the cat. I would draw little bottles. And I drew hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of drawings. And I taught myself how to draw, you know, with its concept of process again, about how to go about doing it. Um, and it was the most wonder, one of the most wonderful experiences I've had um, with nothing. I mean, and that's the thing that was so cool about it, too, was there wasn't anything fancy about it. There wasn't anything fancy about the paper I was using. And, and you know, it was just this one. And, and uh, you know, who was it? Uh, David McCullough, I think, said, um, you know, uh, I, I think it was him that the, the uh, genius is the ability to focus on one thing. Well, I had no distractions. So all I, all I had to do was draw. And the only thing I could do to entertain myself was draw. And so that, that really was this really meaningful experience. And it was, in fact, again, because the one thing I felt bad about was Nick had given me a rocking chair. That was his rocking chair in his studio. He said, yeah, you can have it. And then, like, after he moved into his new space, which was this beautiful loft, he said, you know, this was about six months later, he says, I need that rocking chair back. And so wrong? I was a little, no, it was very depressing. But, you know. That's so wrong. No, it was okay. I mean, I, I guess it was all right. I, I, eventually, I had to move out of the place because the stairs were starting to come off the wall. Yeah. And, and again, again, we're talking, I, I mean, it's hard to imagine what it was like, you know, in New York at that time. And we're, I have to say that uh, not the last place that Elise and I lived, but uh, I, I used to do a tour and would live in each of the shittiest neighborhoods that there were in Manhattan, from the East Village, you know, when the East Village was really rugged, uh, to the meatpacking district, to uh, I lived in the garment district for a while when the garment district was depressed and, in, and the, New York, the New Yorker Hotel had been taken over by the Moonies. So they were my neighbors. And I was like the only person living on the entire block of 35th Street between 7th and 8th Avenue. And I had this incredible expanse of space, but it was so desolate, it was so remote. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, 640 Broadway, um, you know, people don't realize it now, but there was a time where after dark, 8th Street below, below 8th Street would be like, uh, was just totally desolate. There was nobody there. And, uh, you know, so, so I, I did the tour of these different places, and it actually was quite nice. And, you know, uh, hard to believe, but one of the things that was really cool, I mean, the, the students that I teach need to talk to their parents at least eight times a day. I didn't have a phone at all, so I would have to go to a pay phone to call my mother. And every time I would call my mother, she would say, why don't you ever call? And I would say, Mom, I'm on the phone with you right now. But the truth of the matter is I would go for like a two weeks or three weeks and I wouldn't talk to anybody. And nobody could get in touch with me. Now, that sounds like a terrible thing, living in the middle of New York City. But it was great. There was a kind of, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, just out there by myself. 
you know. So then, so maybe this explains your love of finding yourself and your imagery of finding yourself alone on a beach or a figure on a beach. And like, so you really knew how, like an artist does, to understand and to employ solitude. Uh, yeah, maybe. I, again, one of the things I think is that uh, one, of, one of the things that happens a lot is that I, I think when I start a painting, I think, oh, this is going to be a great idea. And then I start with a great idea, and I realize that it was really not such a great idea. For instance, I had a painting that um, I decided that the middle of the painting should be basically empty. And I would have a figure on one end and a figure on the other end. And it was like a 60 by 80 inch painting. And there were going to be two figures, and the middle is going to be empty. And then I said, I'll put, them in, I'll put them in a room. And so there was like you know a wall. And when I looked at it, it was like I had made a goal post. There was like two figures and this thing go across the middle. And I said, this was really stupid. I mean, this was like really not such a great idea. And again, because of the fact that um, a lot of times I, I, I let the, I, I try to figure out what I'm going to do. I let the, the painting speak to me. And I, I'm also very slow. Uh, and what I mean by that is I'm, I'm really slow on the uptake. And this is why sometimes I'll work on paintings for a really long time because I'll look at them and something about them will trouble me and I won't be able to identify what it is. And in only through a period of time and working back into it and, and trying different things will I, will I figure it out. I think that's honorable and just absolutely intrinsic to art, period. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's your process and, and you can't go against it. It's, it's what makes things happen. And look at what you've done. It's fantastic. Well, thanks. Uh, should we talk about teaching quickly? Yeah, just for a second. I mean, I th the first time that I heard about Peter um, was almost simultaneous, I think, with finding out that there were students at Pearson that were going on field trips to Italy. And I was like, what? A public school that takes kids to it? Who is doing this? I mean, I was shocked because I knew that Ross School did it, but I it, it sort of figured, you know, it's so hoity-toity, of course they get to go to wherever, Greece or Italy. But then, I, I mean, I was stunned that you had, that you had worked this out. And it, it just seemed like the most, then, of course, processing it for a moment, well, of course, that's the most natural thing in the world. If there's any opportunity to take kids out of their context in a really profound way, and give them the opportunity to not just look at a culture, not just go there and eat a meal, but actually experience the, the most impactful part of culture, which for me is definitely art, music, the way of life, et cetera. So I just, you know, hats off to you and, and Liz Cataletto and um, Joe Bartolotto and, this, and Pearson and all of you people that make this possible for those kids. I think it's extraordinary and so laudable. And then you look around at the work that's on these walls that is our Sag Harbor and Focus show curated by the great Don Lenzer. And I mean, you, you just see that this is like an inestimably valuable thing to give kids. And I wish that, and we're living in a country with so much division and xenophobia, you know, just kind of a perpetual xenophobia about the world outside of America and America first and all this stuff. And it's just, it's just so the opposite of that and it's so wonderful. And I just wanted to, you know, take my virtual hat well, off to you. you. The other thing I want to mention, and, and we've been so fortunate um, that we have been able, through the Rudishan Trust, which was the, the, the long story, I won't, for everybody with it, to bring in some extraordinary and remarkable artists to work with the kids, professional artists. And the experience of the interaction of the kids with these artists, everybody from Dan Weldon, who came in and did several Prindaganzas with us, and it was really inspiring to the kids. You know, I mentioned before, Scott Sandell uh, has done a variety of different things. And, you know, Scott is, you know, look, I'm, as I said, I'm pretty, I'm like the facilitator, but I'm also the dull facilitator. And, and Scott always is filled with these incredible ideas of what we can do. And we've had Mario Bologna, who we met in Venice, who's a, a master sculptor and mask maker. We brought him to, to Pearson to do, a, to do a workshop in sculpture. 
We, um, you know, uh, Kimberly Munson, who did the Steinbeck thing, uh, our kids had never done portrait sculpture. So this young, uh, wonderful, wonderful sculptor, young woman from Connecticut, who now is a middle-aged woman from Connecticut with two kids, uh, came and did these two incredible sculpture workshops, portrait sculpture workshops with the kids. And it was, it was remarkable because the kids had never sculpted, you know, done it before. And the work they did was incredible. Um, and Perico Pastor from, from Barcelona. Um, and a, a totally different technique of using ink and watercolor to paint. And, and uh, so we have all of these artists and architects uh, that have come in and, and done work with us. And what, what we've tried to do is, whether it's going to foreign countries, whether it's Spain or Italy or, or these, uh, the professional artists that come in, is we've tried to open up the world. Uh, and the world doesn't have to be half the world away. It can be in one of our classrooms at school to the kids. And for them to meet and interact, one of the last things that uh, that Scott had organized was to have a bunch of a variety of professional artists come in and work with the kids uh, using the digital printers. The, the artists were doing their own. Margaret Garrett was one of them. Uh, a number of uh, uh, Steve uh, uh, was an, yeah was another one, and and they were doing their own work, and the kids were watching them, and then they would interact with the kids in terms of talking about the kids and their work you know, and give their kids advice on what they could do in terms of printing things and, and stuff. And this is like, it, it's remarkable. So, uh, in, so in so many ways, you bring the world to your yeah, students, I mean, to uh, your classes, yeah. to, right. and I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't do that without a great school that's receptive to that. And so huge kudos to Pearson for being that school. But it still takes somebody who has the focus and the ambition well, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, you know, I think a lot of the credit goes to the community. And a lot of the credit goes to people who, whether we're talking about the, the collaborations we had with John Germain or the collaborations with the Whaling Museum or the Historic Society, uh, we try to reach out and, and have the kids get engaged with, and, and hopefully now, the, you know, the church. Um, yes, please. Uh, you know, to get engaged with, with uh, the real world. And, and, you know, not to be limited to the notion of, a class, of education being this kind of separate thing, but to, to be part of it. And again, the generosity of people in this community. Um, and I'm not saying this because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be cute about this, but m most of the time my role in all of this is to facilitate things. And, um, to kidnap kids so they participate when they don't want to, those two things. Um, but Then why do they, if they're so kidnapped and you force them, why do they just keep coming back? I mean, clearly you're one of the more loved teachers I've ever, ever met in my life. If you pay people money, they'll say nice things about you. <laughs> no, and I want to mention, you know, for instance, we weren't able to run a lot of, we weren't able to run a lot of workshops this year because of the COVID stuff. And so we did virtual workshops. We, 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 you know, Theo Gray and a couple other young uh, uh, filmmakers. And we would do the virtual digital filmmaking and it worked well online. But one of the things we were able to do and I'm really happy about it was uh, Linda Capella came in and did figure drawing with the kids. And they loved it. I mean, and, and it was so antithetical to, I mean, it was so different from everything else that they do in their lives. Uh, to work, uh, you know, drawing the model for two hours or two and a half hours uh, uninterrupted in a world where we are uh, addicted to distraction, where if you saw one of my classes, you would not believe, you know, just, you know, five minute attention spans. I mean, it's like, you know, but then to, to, to have uh, Linda come in, to have the art, other artists come in, it, it's, just, it's just been, it's been wonderful. And again, um, we, and this is what I'm really proud of. We have sent from our little tiny school, and again, when you talk, all right, I never finish a sentence, but I'll try to, let me, something else. When we first went to Italy, we had kids who went on the trip that had never been on an airplane. And that's a transformation that's happened in Sag Harbor. 
we had kids, this was a working class community. There was a kind of attitude that people had about the other schools, like, and I'm not talking about the Ross School. The Diana Ross School did not exist at that time. I'm talking about East Hampton and South Hampton. There were kids and people in this community who thought that we were always gonna be second rate, that we couldn't, we couldn't compete with them. And um, one of my dear friends, my, one of my best friends ever, Bob Schneider became the principal of the school and his aspiration was to, first of all, he believed in the kids. And his aspiration was to make our school something really special. And we have sent our kids from our little school to the best schools in the country. They are living, some of them, in our community still painting and making art. Some of, uh, one, of one of our kids is in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, doing graphic design, we have people in New Zealand, we have people all over, all over the world and they are making art and they are doing architecture and they are making the world a better place. And I have to tell you, I'm gonna say something else and this is sort of like a semi-political statement. Well, maybe, I don't know if it is. You used to be able to say, or you hear this all the time where people would say, uh, you should act like adults. Well, adults now are acting really shitty. And what I'm really proud about is that we have a core of kids, like the kids who did this work here, who are acting better than adults. And instead of tearing things down, and instead of being angry at each other, um, they're, they're giving each other the benefit of the doubt, and they're making the world a better place and a more beautiful place. And if the adults acted like them, we would be in a much better world. And I mean that sincerely. I, I think that's probably a good place to end. And I think that that is some kind of definition of a great teacher to what you just said, having students that emerge from your counseling. To, to be able to do those things. It's Thanks. extraordinary. Yeah, and I, I want to thank everybody I, for coming tonight. This is actually, um, I had asked April before I said, you're charging money? And then I said, <laughs> people will come? And she said, Dad, don't worry about it. Well, I, I didn't have uh, a lot of confidence in that, but I appreciate that all of you, all of you guys show, you know, sounds bad. All of you came tonight, and um, I hope that uh, you know, showing the slides and stuff wasn't uh, too onerous and Oh my you know, God, no, don't be ridiculous. That was wonderful. We also have um, a little present for you. It's not our present, it's Liz's present to you, but we think that we need to. What is this? Well, nobody asked me to make a speech, but I just have to say something quick. Yeah, go for it, girl. Um, oh, Peter, you know who this is? What, what I'm Liz Cataletto, formerly Marchesella. I see a lot of familiar faces here. And I'm presenting this. Uh, April and I were in communication about what should we do for Peter after um, his talk. And um, she asked me, should we get a cake? Should we get a trophy? Should we do these <laughs> things? And I said, a trophy? Well, Sure, but I have a good idea. And I'm presenting this to you as a former student, as a coworker, and as a dear friend. I can't get through anything without crying. I'm very sorry. <laughs> Peter is retiring, and when I started teaching with him, he gave me this same gift. So I thought I'd pay it forward, and I would give Yay. it to you. So you have to open it. I have to open it? Right now. Yeah, you too. Yes. And then there will be cake. <laughs> Here, I'll take it. It's not Ralph Lauren. Don't show the box. <laughs> do you remember what you gave me my first day? Yes, I do. Oh, nice color. Oh. A vest. <laughs> So thank you so much for coming. Come on over here. We're going to have cake and libations. And um, it's, I just salute you from the bottom of my heart, Peter. I think you're just one of the great human beings ever. And 
Um, I kind of have a feeling that you might be retiring, but there's going to be some umbilical tethers on you from this whole community. So we'll see how far you get. Thank you. <laughs>